So we're going to begin this evening's um, program by hearing from Charles Peltz, and uh, Charles will kind of give an overview of how he sees uh, Gunther Schubert's legacy. Uh, thank you very much, Hankus, and welcome to everyone. First, I want to thank Hankus and the CMA department for inviting me to participate and to congratulate them on this remarkable anniversary. To discuss Gunther Schuller in terms of education begins with a foundational irony that he had very little formal education nor any degree from any institution, absolutely none. So he was spared both dull pedantry as well as the fads of the education experts. In fact, the blessing of his life may be that he adhered to no educational theory. Instead, he recognized that much like the two essentials of organic chemistry, carbon and hydrogen, there were two elements necessary for a great education, curiosity on the part of the learner and the teacher to satisfy that curiosity. Thus, he brought to NEC people, people who loved, knew deeply and expertly practiced their field, though many were not yet known as teachers. And then in a masterful understanding of how to make work his unique vision of curity, curiosity and explanation he let the teachers free, each doing what they would with little supervision. That freedom, unknown in most other places, unlocked the teaching and learning. That free reign meant that NEC would often be more Wild West than pleasantly organized East. Yes, a nightmare to administer, to budget, and to plan for as an institution. But that was a necessary trade-off learning and creating freely was most important and how to organize that freedom was a distressed handmaiden. If there's an anecdote that shows how Gunther learned, how his curiosity was an ever present fuse waiting to be lit, this might shed some light. Most of us know that when Gunther was at a dinner party for good reason, he usually dominated the room. One night he found himself at a dinner and was holding forth until he discovered that a rather quiet Irish gentleman at the table had spent some years in seminary. Gunther became a completely different person. He had never had the opportunity to question someone who had done this. And the questions then poured forth. What was that experience like? What made motivated him to both begin and end his seminary career? Question after question was asked Gunther offering no comment on answers. He was listening fully and then asking the next question. A half hour went by at least until he had drained that poor Irishman of every thought he had ever had about his life in seminary. Gunther the Curious had engaged fully and re-enrolled himself in his school, the one he created within himself and brought into it as teachers the myriad others he met as he experienced life. The best teaching Gunther did was in rehearsal. And there is one aspect which I think addressed, addresses so much of who he was. Gunther was obsessed with balances, absolutely obsessed. He couldn't imagine a voice being unheard. And his solution was never for the unheard voice to be louder but for all others to be quieter. This might be a great metaphor for Gunther, the teacher, the administrator, the civil rights evangelist. Then when it came to those around him, he wanted a student, a person, to listen always for others, to hear what others had to say before themselves, to draw back oneself so another voice could come forth. He was content only when all could be heard. For Gunther, with his protean ear, to learn, to listen, was to learn. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Charles. And by the way, we also have 38 other Zoomers on this. Uh, you can't see them, but they can see us. Um, Thank you so much for that, Charles. That was a wonderful way of introducing Gunther. Now, the question, there's a question as to whether Ran has sound, like because we haven't heard anything from there. Olivia, what, what's happening with that? Does he need to reboot his computer, perhaps, or something? 
Okay, so we're going to move on. We'll move on. Meanwhile, that would be great. So, um, you know what might be good actually after that to hear Carl's video. I'm sorry that I'm going to go in a different order, but I think with Ray and not speaking, I think let's have Carl speak. So, Carl Atkins was the um, inaugural department head, department chair for Jazz and Afro American <laughs> Studies here at uh, the Conservatory. And Carl actually met Gunther on a tour um, when he was, it was a touring company for Tremonitia, the uh, job, wasn't it a touring company for? He met Gunther's father. Yeah. yeah oh, oh yeah, he met Gunther's father and Gunther's father said, hey, my son, it, right, that's right, that's right. My son's looking for somebody like you. Um, so he, he ended up being in a touring company and, 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 and playing with Gunther and playing all the necessary instruments. He played the, all the saxophones, he played the clarinet, he played all the woodwinds actually. And um, he was someone who Gunther felt would be a perfect person to be the inaugural chair for Jazz and Afro-American Studies at NBC. And he hired him in 1969 to start that program. And so we're gonna hear from Carl. Carl is pre-recorded, although we can probably fool you into thinking that he's uh, actually online there, but he is he is out of the country at the moment, but it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, tribute that he has. And what he's going to talk about, I asked him to speak about what Gunther's um, idea was in starting the um, Jazz and Afro-American Studies department here at NEC, what he was looking for, what he wanted that to represent. So uh, we'll hear, let's hear from Carl. I'll also mention that Carl. Hello. Oh, there we go. My name is Carl Atkins. I would like to thank Hankus Netsky for inviting me to offer my perspective on Gunther Schuller's educational legacy at the New England Conservatory. He asked me to speak briefly on a couple of topics. One, how the jazz program was started and two, what was Gunther's educational philosophy specifically related to jazz? In addition, I want to speak a bit about my sense of Gunther's perception of a relationship between third stream music and the proposed jazz program. In 1968, Gunther invited me to teach saxophone at NEC and explore with him the possibility of establishing a degree granting program in jazz. In recent conversations with various people researching and writing about the history of the NEC Jazz Department, I've been asked about the origin of the original label for the department, Afro-American Music and Jazz Studies. So much time has passed that some of the details of the many conversations I had with Gunther and others about starting this program have faded. Generally, we agreed on most of the elements we thought should be included in the program. In addition to private instruction, we wanted classes in improvisation, jazz composition, and participation in small and large ensembles. We also had to include liberal arts courses in order to receive approval for the degree from the various accrediting agencies like the National Association of Schools of Music. We both had similar and fairly strong opinions on the fundamental character of the program. My sense was that Gunther's focus for the program was on performance and composition. While my background also had been primarily in performance, I had recently developed a serious interest in jazz history and black culture, especially music. As we continued our discussions, we both realized that the connection of culture and history was important and wanted to create a degree program that went beyond just performance and connected performance to history and culture. Because of this, it was decided that courses in American history, American music history, jazz history, Afro-American music history, and so forth also should be included. From these discussions came the decision to label the degree Afro-American music and jazz studies. I do not know when or why the degree title was changed to just jazz studies. I have some thoughts about it, but that would have to be the topic of another discussion. 
Hankus also asked about Gunther's and my views on the state of jazz pedagogy and various pretend, printed materials available at that time. While I don't recall that we made calculated efforts to evaluate written materials and teaching approaches being used in the handful of college level programs around the country, we both agreed that students should learn from jazz masters in person, utilizing the time honored tradition of oral tradition. This was accomplished early on by bringing to the faculty composer George Russell, pianist composer Jackie Byard, pianist organist Webster Lewis. In addition, through our various professional relationships, we were able to bring in jazz masters like Thad Jones, Mel Lewis, Jerry Mulligan, and Clark Terry. Also, in an effort to enhance offerings in Afro-American music, I wrote and received grants from the Ford Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts to create a lecture performance series featuring experts in various genres of Afro-American music. These grants allowed us to bring in people like African drummer, dancer, Babatundi Olatunji, jazz trumpeter, Kenny Dorham, education director of the New York Philharmonic, Leon Thompson, and composer, Hale Smith. Unfortunately, we were not able to continue this series as this was about the time that NEC was facing a number of financial crises. Unfortunately, the series was not revived or included in future NEC budgets. Just some final words that relate to the founding of the Third Stream Contemporary Musical Arts Department. While it would be dishonest of me to take any direct credit for the establishment of the Third Stream Department, in some ways, discussions, or should I say arguments, between Guther and I over the years about the validity of Third Stream music indirectly led him to creating NC, N, NEC's Third Stream Department. Mm -hmm. Initially, Guther wanted to have Third Stream be a part of the jazz department. Mm -hmm. In the eyes of my 24-year-old wisdom or stupidity, I fought against this pretty vigorously. I felt having Third Stream associated with jazz would dilute the purpose of an Afro-American music and jazz studies program as I perceived it. This was the only real agreement I, disagreement I can remember ever having with Gother, and it later led to about a three-month non-speaking period between us. <laughs> I don't remember what brought it to an end, but no doubt it was due to Gother's efforts. As time went on, and I grew up both musically and personally, I came to appreciate the concepts and products of this musical approach and its adherence. So I want to offer my congratulations to Rand Blake and Hankus Netsky on the 50th anniversary of the founding of this department and for forging ahead to create and develop the current contemporary musical arts department. Thank you. That, that, that was news to me and that was news to Ken too, right? <laughs> so that, that was really wonderful that, to have Carl. Um, so the question is, is Rand now ready to speak? Your, uh, your genius, Olivia. Let's hear for Olivia for getting our time. Say hello. All right, so let's hear for Rand. I followed Gunther for many years in the 50s. He did superb concerts at Carnegie Recital Hall, and he coined the word third stream. Uh, his first memory of me was the 1958 sweeping floor at Atlantic Records when Nessie Erdogan and Tom Dowd were persuaded to engage me for six weeks. It was a very exciting time. 
I had met Mary Lou Williams, Oscar Peterson, and then a few months later started studying with Gunther Schuller <clears throat> once or twice a year. And when I moved to New York in 1960, we met regularly. Uh, much has been said about Gunther as a composer, administrator, author, critic, and Charles Pelch, you're right, he does listen, even though at a party he can be the talker, but he has astounding memory. Uh, I was flabbergasted at our lessons. He could tune in, he could decipher what was redundant in my playing. He taught me to listen to myself. I already was a lover of history, but he gave me 90% more of this. I had an unfortunate time in Greece, 1967, when on April 20th, the junta took over. I had hoped to have some connection with Mika Theodorakis. I did meet Yanni Christou, a, a close friend of Gunther. I uh, suddenly returned to Rome via Oslo and back to New York, talking about atrocities in Greece. And I got hired by Gunther and I started right on the bottom rung of the conservatory, working in the mail room uh, and having a disastrous experience trying to run the Brown Hall elevator. That lasted two Friday noons. Uh, Immediately after, I don't think it was because of my nonsense, it became uh, automatic. <laughs> I saw uh, Gunther uh, champion the people on faculty council, uh, saw him introduce ragtime. We heard him conduct Firestone and most importantly, Rite of Spring. Uh, what an overwhelming time it was at the conservatory. <clears throat> and I don't know, I think, Carly, you were here when we closed for six weeks, five weeks, six weeks uh, in uh, uh, working with the citizens who were protesting our presence in Vietnam. And there were 24-hour concerts in Jordan Hall. All classes were suspended. Uh, Charles and Carl have been very eloquent on uh, Gunther, and uh, he made many decisions. The year I came, 1967, September, he had hired Russell Sturman, John Wolt, John Heiss, and so many others. Uh, every day I really miss him. It's been a joy to see his two sons grow up, Ed Schuler, bass, George Schuler, composer, arranger, uh, percussionist. And when chauffeuring Gunther in 68 at Tanglewood, I got really to appreciate the warmth of Marjorie Schuler and Gunther's father. Uh, may his presence live for long and he will be uh, the great uh, presence at the future of New England Conservatory. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I just want to, of course, very much thank the uh, folks from alumni and advancement for getting behind this event. And I, I hope that they appreciate, uh, here we have the two founders of these programs that Gunther envisioned and, and really wanted to see at a conservatory that no other school really had. You know, at that time, um, jazz was sort of considered an industry thing. It was like a trade thing. And it was, it was basically, um, you know, a, a commercial career kind of idea. And that was true at New England Conservatory too who had a popular music program that, that went back to the 50s, but it was a certificate. 
And um, and there was nothing like Third Stream, which eventually became contemporary improvisation, now contemporary musical arts. So um, it really was, you know, it was quite a vision and so special tonight to have with us both the founding chair of Jazz and African American Studies and also of Third Stream. So we're so delighted that uh, Rand could join us here and we'll participate in the discussion later. Uh, meanwhile, I want to introduce Susan Calkins. Um, Susan actually wrote a book about the jazz department at New England Conservatory. And uh, in doing that, interviewed Gunther for, um, well, she, she was said just today, she listened to one of her hour and a half interviews with Gunther, um, that she um, really heard a tremendous amount about what Gunther was looking for when he did that. And, and he was generous with, with his time. And uh, so uh, let's, let's see if Susan has a doctorate in education from, uh, from Boston University and uh, was a student at NEC though, where she did her master's yeah, in jazz, jazz, right? In jazz studies as a flute, flute player and composer. So uh, Susan Calkins. Well, I did a lot of um, interviews with Carl and Rand and Gunther uh, and wrote my dissertation on the legacy of jazz studies at NEC. Um, but I thought because we have so many esteemed guests here that are that are faculty members and people that go way back like Pankus um, to the beginning of, of, of Gunther's tenure here, I thought I would talk a little bit about who Gunther was as in his younger life before he arrived at NEC and how it affected his philosophy of music education and also his influence on music education in the United States, because I think that um, ultimately he had he had a great deal of influence on, on the direction of mu music education today in K through 12 schools. Um, so Gunther took a great great pride in, in calling himself a high school dropout. And uh, he he always mentioned the fact that he was a high school dropout. And um, but he really benefited from an incredible education and overall education and from the time he was a very young child, um, was sent away at the age of six, uh, sent on a boat from New York across the ocean and was at a private school in Germany as a, as a young child. He, he traveled by himself and he liked to write about that as well. Um, and he, he was... He was interminably curious and interested in just about everything and very adventurous. And so he, um, he, he ended up coming back to the United States to go to school when he had a terrible accident as a child. He lost an eye um, in a very bizarre accident at school and ended up back in Manhattan with his family. Um, at the age of 16, this is like why he likes to call himself a high school dropout. At the age of 16, he was principal hornist, French hornist um, with the Cincinnati Symphony. Um, and he began his career in his career in music. Even prior to that, he played with the American Ballet Theater, theater before that as a, as a young teenager. And then he um, he taught at the Manhattan School of Music when he was uh, twenty around the age of twenty five. He also taught at Yale University for um, composition. Um, then was also involved in the in the beginning of the Berkshire Music Center at Tanglewood. Um, and he claims that when he came to NEC, he knew nothing about education and that he had never thought about it. And uh, he said he knew six months ahead of time that he had been asked to be president of, of NEC. He knew six months that six months prior, and he began thinking, he says, about music education and what his philosophy was. So by the time he got here in 1967, he, um, he had done a little bit of thinking about it, obviously. And he was involved at the at the Tanglewoods, um, the Berkshire Music Center. He was um, invited to be a speaker with the what was then called the Music Educators National Conference. Um, it's now 
called the National Association for Music Education. He, um, it was a, they put together a group of teachers, philosophers, um, education specialists to have a consortium about, um, about the state of music education in the United States from K through 12 music education. And um, at this time, Gunther had this, this vision. He had, he had also published his book, Early Jazz, um, in 1967, right around the time that he was hired here. So he had done a lot of um, research and writing about jazz, and he had also obviously performed jazz with various um, esteemed jazz artists. But um, when he came, when he came here, uh, he was invited early on in that, that summer of 1967. He was invited to the Tangle. They had a Tanglewood Symposium that was sponsored by Boston University. And um, he was one of the primary speakers. And the thing that he, he promoted was jazz education. He, this is where he basically said, um, jazz is America's treasure and it needs to be included in all music education. And students in K through 12 schools should be introduced to, to jazz and to other world musics. And, um, and from there, the Tanglewood Symposium came out with a um, declaration where they outlined, you know, the various aspects of music education that they felt were absolutely necessary for um, a well-rounded education for public school students in the United States. And, um, and I feel that Gunther's input at this conference really influenced the declaration that came out of this. Now, later on, um, the National Association for Music Education adopted a lot of these, these ideas and then came up with what are, what are now called the National Core Standards of Music Education. And um, I just wanted to say what some of the primary aspects of, of what, what is the core philosophy for music education in the United States, which is, which is adopted by basically every state in the country. Um, improvisation, composition, and connections to other art forms and introduction to world music in general. And um, he was adamant that, that students needed to be introduced to various forms of, of music and that, that music should be included in part of the core curriculum um, in K through 12 schools. So um, I think that he had, he had a huge influence on what is going on in, in public schools today. Now, I have a lot of experience as a public school teacher and a private school teacher, so I, I know what is expected of these teachers and improvisation, composition, jazz studies are all part of the core repertoire of, of teachers today in music education in those types of schools. Um, I also re recently read, the, read an, an address that he gave um, here at NEC for the 100th anniversary of NEC. I, I, um, you may be familiar with that, but I just wanted to um, read what he wrote. He, he said in his address about what his intention was. This is right at the beginning of his tenure here. And um, so he kind of outlay, laid out his philosophy of what he wanted, what his vision for the conservatory was. He said, um, in my view, the conservatory must be an institution where the young musician can go to expand the range and depth of his, his, uh, yeah, his their personal perception to sharpen their, um, their instrumental capacities and to broaden their general intellectual horizon. In short, to be the best, most complete kind of professional. And this is where you know his, his idea of the complete musician was. I think the last thing that I'd just like to say is that he, he also was um, very adamant about the humanities and about having the human, study of humanities be a part of the education of a complete musician. And uh, he advocated for students to understand the history and the background of various types of music, but also 
the cultures that went along with that. And, um, and he encouraged students to, to go visit the MFA as often as possible and to make, make as many connections as he could. Um, I think that's about all I need to say. Respond to things. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's so valuable to hear about before NEC and what the educational philosophy was that he brought here. Um, amazing. Thank you so much for that. Um, and the humanities thing, I think, was so interesting because the people he hired to teach in the humanities were a little different, right, Derek? <laughs> um, you know, Lee Sanford Halpern was the head of this Pro, this uh, program, and he really was a philosopher. I mean, he was not not the kind of guy who was training you for your SATs. Um, and and uh, they, he hired a major poet at the time. He hired, um, you know, it was it was a very different kind of humanities program. It was not a it was not about academics. We're gonna, I mean, that's a word you hear around here quite a bit these days, actually. So it, it wasn't really about that. It was really about, and also by the way. I will say that he was responsible for making the entire curriculum pass fail, which was very interesting. He didn't want, he knew people came here to study music and he didn't want the humanities hanging them up as long as they showed up to class. So that was actually an interesting yeah. part of his philosophy. It was maybe, you know, the, the high school dropout uh, revenge. Oh, a yeah. Little bit, as, as many things were. He, he said to me um, that he, he said, I was a complete idiot about academia. He said, I didn't even know the difference between a, an undergraduate or a graduate degree when I, when I showed up here. <laughs> there you go. So uh, the next person I'd love to turn to then is someone who was a student here. Um, in exactly the same, uh, a little before me, actually, I think one year before me, uh, you must have come here in 72, 71. I, I was here as a graduate student. Oh, so it was 74. So it was the same, same period. Um, and what I've asked Ken to talk about were the opportunities that Gunther gave students here, but, but of course you can certainly expand on whatever you'd like to talk about. So Ken Radonofsky, who is our uh, saxophone teacher here at New England Conservatory. Well, thank you, Hankis. Um, and uh, just as all of us who have spoken, uh, uh, we loved Gunther and uh, we remember him and that's and his birthday's coming up and that's why we formed the Gunther Schuler Society and I'm uh, honored to be uh, talking about what it was like to be a student and then a faculty member in the Schuler era. Uh, the first thing that I would note about Gunther is he treated everyone the same, uh, whether it was faculty or students, we were all equals, at least we thought we were. And um, he never slept and he was always working. Uh, and uh, that was, I can give you specific instances based on our 3 a.m. recording sessions. Oh, yeah. uh, but um, as, as, as my college years began at NEC, uh, just by sheer luck, I ended up in a course called Score and Sound. And Victor Rosenbaum, John Heiss, and Gunther Schuler team taught that class my very first semester. I remember sitting next to Jillian Rogel and uh, various other people in the class. We all felt very lucky. And after every class, we were rendered speechless. I remember the class when Gunther came in and he jotted down whatever page it was of prelude to the afternoon of a fawn. Uh, I, I, maybe it was, let's say it was page 17. He, he didn't have a score with him, but he wrote down page 17. He, he, he did his own uh, manuscript on the, on the blackboard, which is, I think, I think still there. No chalk anymore, uh, but he, he, he wrote it down. And then for the next two hours, we talked about the French horn needing to retune or not as 
it was playing a pedal in one measure, but it was the third or it was the fifth in different places in the court. And so he talked about that for, for two hours and it was, they were things we had never thought of. And then another time um, he talked about a composer's use of relative and absolute dynamics. I, I didn't know what that was. And, and it was just ear opening and eye opening. And every class was like that. I still have my notes. They're in my studio. Um, he expected us to know, or at least try everything, just like him. If he could do it, he believed that we could do it. And he convinced us that we could. And we didn't even dream of this. We didn't know that we would be able to, or in this case, I have to speak of myself. Uh, I, I didn't know that I could transcribe a, a jazz solo, never try. And so, you know, I'm listening to Frankie Trumbauer or Chet Hazlett trying to take off these, uh, these solos, and it took me forever. Uh, but it was fun. And every challenge he put in front of us was an opportunity, as I viewed it, a chance to improve. And every week, it seemed, at least for these two and a half years uh, that I've been asked to speak of, there was something important that was happening at school. I, I can say that virtually every student was involved uh, in the school, uh, um, as, I, as I mentioned, Hank is uh, Dirk Hillier, who's here. Um, uh, Bo Winokur, uh, famous jazz player, uh, played in the orchestra. I, I don't think he played the solo in Petrushka, but he played in the orchestra. Ed and George, uh, jazz players, were playing in the orchestra. Um, Gunther, uh, Gunther, and I'm, I'm going to give you a list of the things that we did in just a moment. But as, uh, as um, Carl spoke of having a disagreement with Gunther, <laughs> Gunther liked people who stood up as long as they had something to say. He didn't mind if they disagreed or if they brought up something that he hadn't thought of. And uh, it's really the mark of a great leader. Um, and, I, and I do remember uh, um, in, in that first year, it was Charles Ives' 100th birthday. And one of the special things that Gunther did was he brought the orchestra to the Kennedy Center to celebrate Charles Ives' birthday. And one of the pieces we did was the General Slocum, which was a minute and a half piece that happened to have a baritone saxophone part. Um, the saxophone was the boat whistle of the General Slocum, which sunk. And so if you can imagine, the only note the saxophone was to play was a low B flat, as loud as possible. And Gunther, Gunther was going to use Myron Romano, who, who was a pianist who was going with him, great pianist who had never played the baritone saxophone. But Gunther thought, ah, one note, you know, you can teach Myron to play at low B flat. And so I was, I was in his score and sound class and I heard about it and I thought, that's not right. And so I, 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 went, to, I went to see Gunther. He was in a meeting and I, and I slowly wrote out my appeal that, um, that a sax, no matter how small the part, that a saxophone player should do it. And even if it's not me, someone who, who should get to play that part. And I wrote ultra slow. And when Gunther came out of the door, I put the piece of paper on the top of the pile. And so he looked at the piece of paper and he says, 
where are you going to be for the next hour? And I said, I'm going to be downstairs trying to just uh, trying to transcribe that jazz solo that I can't hear. And he said, just give me an hour and I'll, I'll get back to you. So he came downstairs in an hour and he said, you're right. He says, and you're playing. He said, great, thanks. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's just an example of him listening to people. Um, so during those two years, amongst the things that I played were uh, a 20th Century Innovations concert, which was a recreation of his Brandeis and New York City concerts, playing the greatest contemporary music of the era, including uh, All Set uh, by Milton Babbitt. We played Luigi Nono, Monodia Polyphonica et Ritmica, and strangely, and again, Gunther was a genius at this, he decided that it would be better for me to play the bass clarinet and for Bruce Creditor to play the alto saxophone part. Well, funny, but it, <laughs> it, it worked. Uh, we did the Rite of Spring, Patricia, very famous jazz opera by Ernst Krennic with a cast of thousands, I swear. The whole Johnny Spieltauf, uh, where the hero is a, uh, a saxophonist violinist. And, um, and I thought, I thought I was hot stuff because this was at the end of uh, school and I was going to become a member of the faculty. And by the way, in all of these productions, faculty and students, everybody's, everybody's invited, everybody's involved. But uh, I'm, on the, uh, I'm in the offstage jazz band and there was this idiom by Krennic, da 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 I looked at it, I played it. Gunther says, saxophone, rhythm's wrong. And I looked at it and I knew it was right. But I'm not going to tell Gunther he's wrong. Just I just knew it was it was right. Da 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 da. Second time, saxophone I said it's wrong. So I looked at it. It was right. Um, so um, third time, played it wrong. Glasses go on the stand. He says, "I told you, it's wrong." And then he said, and you're going to be teaching here next year. And, and, and so the choice, the choice was to personalize it or to look at the music again. And I'll be darned. He was right. And it, and it because I didn't look close enough and Krennic wrote a naive version of Da, 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 da. Oh. So that's what he and Gunther heard it. He didn't tell me what was wrong, but he taught me that we always have to look closer at what the composer wrote. And we have, we have to look closer at the score and we can't take anything for granted. Mm -hmm. And so it was a great lesson. And had I personalized it, I wouldn't have learned anything. And that's what it was always like with Gunther. You could personalize it, and he, I suppose some people did, uh, but that wasn't the way I looked at it. Um, and then um, just a, a one or two uh, small uh, little stories, um, mentioning the uh, recording sessions we did of the white men music. Um, we were recording uh, at uh, basically... I, I remember like nine to three, but uh, it, whatever it was, it was the middle of the night because <laughs> there couldn't be there couldn't be any sound. We, we didn't could, you know, no cars on the road at at, at the, these particular times, uh, whenever it was. And but I do remember one session, the last session that ended at, at three a.m. and and Gunther said, "This will be the most special and best thing." for many of you you've ever done in your life. Um, and uh, well, it, but it's, it, it was, it was one of the most special. It wasn't 
the most special. <laughs> it was it was a a call that if you work hard enough, you can create and recreate moments like this through your whole career. Mm -hmm. And that's what he inspired us to do. I also remember that night when he said that, someone in the trumpet section, sorry, uh, uh, someone in the trumpet section lightheartedly but later regretted it greatly, um, said, just send the check. Oh, no. And so that elicited a lecture on integrity and why we play music. So every moment with Gunther was a lesson. And, uh, and he instilled lifelong learning in us, uh, he taught us that you can't learn it all in school. Um, I would say that most of what I learned, I learned after school. But Gunther taught us how to learn by being curious. And that is his legacy, expectation, and demand for himself and for all of us. That was Gunther. Mm -hmm. Thanks.